izlenim Hello and welcome everybody to uh, Symposium 2 this afternoon of the Thursday uh, session of the Charter Day meeting. Uh, my name is Paul Redmond, I'm Professor of Surgery here at UCC and Cork University Hospital and joining me as co-chair today is Professor Ronan Cahill, uh, who is Professor of Surgery in UCD and Consultant Surgeon in the Matter University Hospital as well as Head of the Centre for Precision Surgery there. We have some um, outstanding speakers uh, to present this afternoon, uh, some of them pre-recorded and some of them thankfully with us live. Each talk will be approximately 15 minutes. Uh, we will record your questions. Um, as you know, you can log on and add your questions on the screen and we'll address those later. And I would ask my colleague Roland perhaps to chair the question session. So uh, we have five talks, each lasting 15 minutes. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Mark Slack, who is Chief Medical Officer with Cambridge Medical Robotics. Um, and he's going to talk to us about robotics and digital technology in surgery. Mark, thank you. Can you, is that up? Yeah, I can see it, Mark. Yes, it's up there, Mark. For inviting me to the meeting. Um, it's a shame we can't have it in person. I always enjoy a trip across the island. And um, you are, but that's a long story. Um, so today I'm going to speak about versus a robot, robotics and digital um, technology. Um, surgery um, annually with roughly deaths, which is fairly stark um, statistic. Four deaths per billion hours in is 50 deaths per billion hours of operation, and in it is 50 to 100 thousand deaths per billion hours both educationally professionally technologically improve these figures our expenditure on health is really astronomical necessarily giving good results this um, study from america shows in the red line on the left graph that the united states is spending roughly 324 percent of gdp on health and yet on and graph, you'll see that's against the life expectancy of birth. So this enormous um, expenditure output, it is not translating to good. Um, I'm a great space of use in healthcare, increasingly well characterized and we must get away from. And I'm a great believer that we should be choosing wisely in what we do. So let's start with the original query, minimal access surgery, Open, which is where I started this journey. Well, there are lower incisional hernia rates. Besides, they occur some, some between open and laparoscopic, but in open surgery, 50% return to hospital and 12% return to theatre. And this costs the European economy about 19 billion um, euros a year. Um, marked reduction in pain with MAS, and that's not just about getting people back to work. If you look at the opiate crisis in the United States, anything we can do to lower opiate, lower opiate use is a good thing. Pain, actually, opiates in America kill more Americans than car crashes, guns, AIDS at its peak, and the entire Vietnam War. So we should be working to reduce the use of painkillers. Overall, all complications are reduced by roughly 50% if you do a procedure by minimal access rather than by an open route. And yet, despite this statistic, in the United States of America, only 70% of appendices are done laparoscopically, 30% of colectomies, 13% of hysterectomies, and a third of lung lobectomies. So despite all the many advantages of minimal access surgery, it has not had the pickup it should have done after 35 years. So why is this the case? Well, minimal access surgery remains difficult. Training and acquisition is difficult. It's difficult to master. It's physically demanding. And becoming an expert takes time, dedication, and effort. And that's not always um, what people are willing to put their 
time into. So it came to the point was if minimal access is um, has a poor uptake, would robotic surgery overcome the difficulty? Well, robots have been around since 2000, yet only 3% of robotic um, of minimal access surgeries by 2018 were done robotically and the majority of those. So we polled surgeons and asked them why, uh, this is a group of, of um, expert minimal access surgeons, why they hadn't um, picked up robotic surgery. And they said, because it was too expensive, the robots were too big, lack of haptics, port sizes were bigger, number of ports, um, different positions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so we set out to wonder, if, could we potentially um, do something different? And what they told us they wanted was a robot for all disciplines, equivalent cost to straight stick, available for high usage, adaptable to any theater, modular and quick to set up. So our solution was to build our own robot. And from humble beginnings, um, where this was a prototype that we used to demonstrate to investors what we we're trying to achieve, we've actually developed a robotic system modeled on the human arm, which holds an end on, which enables it to be a smaller robot with more versatility and better reach than robotics that depend on Z rails. And there's the whole um, robot. This is a three arm setup on the right hand side, surgeon in the left hand side at an open console. So basically, this is portable and transportable. These units are only five foot six high, and the base is 38 by 38 centimeters. You can sit or stand at the working station. Um, it's got a unique wrist design, which enables both roll, pitch, and yaw, which enables us to get better reach um, with a much smaller robotic um, design. And it has wristed um, instruments that pass through five millimeter ports, giving seven degrees of freedom. The arms are collaborative, so the assistant can move the arm out the way without the surgeon realizing that the arm has been um, repositioned. So the idea was to have this um, amazing robotic system to do it. But building a robot is not enough. Just I should also mention with the modularity, and um, we can also choose how many arms we use. So we can do a procedure purely laparoscopically, or we could choose to do one or two arms and do a hybrid type procedure, part laparoscopically, part robotically. And that gives you all the choices. Because of the modularity and the ability to move the bases, um, you can pick the port positions that you would normally use in laparoscopic surgery, and the procedural steps remain largely the same. So the learning curve is easier. But having a robot, just a robot, is not enough. Um, we went through a very um, clear research program using the ideal collaboration to do pre-clinical pre studies, um, early clinical studies, and now um, large um, post-marketing clinical studies to show safety. Um, we also believe that we should have a registry, which I'll tell you about later, um, to look at um, data and outcome. So we did over 300 cadaveric studies in a variety of specialties from gynecology to um, head and neck and base of skull. Then we did a phase 2A study, which is a proof of concept live study, a 90 day follow up under ethics, and then proceeded to two cohort studies and a registry of all comers. Of course, we now have multiple other cohort studies, and our registry has um, over um, 4,000 patients entered into it. Sorry, it's not moving. Um, ongoing research, we've done research on esophagectomy, thymectomy, lobectomies, and we've got a very large colorectal cohort, and we've done hernias. We're also doing economic studies, and we have embedded registry studies. But of course, training is also incredibly important in the world of robotics. Um, we believe that one of the things we're trying to do with robotics is to standardize surgery. So you follow a certain set of, of um, steps in an order, we have transparency, so we're using open source metrics. We're using artificial um, intelligence to reduce variables. And this all steps up towards robotic surgery being an advanced form of surgery. The issues that actually need resolving, thousands of patients are harmed annually. 50% of surgical complications could be reduced by standardized care. And surgery needs better tools to carry out um, the surgery. So our educational philosophy is we believe in responsible training. We um, deliver training to the entire team, not just the surgeon. We deliver training to the um, scrub staff as well. 
and um, the bedside assistance, and we include the anaesthetists in it as well. So in 2022, our training, we have an um, e learning module. They then have um, a simulation trainer, which is now in um, a virtual reality headset, so we can send it to you at your home to train. The system setup training is also now done on headset virtual reality. And then we do have face-to-face -face system setup team training, technical training. And then once people start getting ready, we have ongoing support with telementoring and virtual classrooms. When the people start on our system, we have precepted cases, always have a dry run the day before. And then we do have cadaveric basic surgical skills training so that the surgeons can feel comfortable when they go into the OR for the first time. As I said, the new training technology, we have an e-learning platform, um, which you can have on your phone <coughs> or on your um, laptop, on your PC. Um, there's a trainer which comes with every single, that's a simulator with every single robot. And now we've put the simulator onto a virtual reality headset so that you can train in the convenience um, of your home. Remote proctoring, we spent a lot of money on and remote clinical education training and initially driven to it by COVID, but we've realized the value of it. It facilitates peer-to-peer -peer training. Um, it allows surgeons to collaborate with experts in different geographies. It allows remote technical support and also allows data capture for, um, and ca for analysis and comparison. <clears throat> and the whole thing we do with a metric-based review. So we train people now towards a metric-based competence rather than somebody just saying they're good enough to go and that's um, working quite well. There's a surgeon-focused app, which has all your videos on it and your um, immediate statistics, which you can download and keep for um, ready reference. More importantly, we have a registry of all comers. I think registries are massively important in modern healthcare. We use control method analysis, which I don't really have time to go into today, but it's not summary statistics and it's more something you would do in manufacturing. All our surgeons get a regular printout of the number of cases they've done, the types of cases they've done. We have funnel plots where we will send the surgeon their funnel plots. Could be for time, for complications, could be for um, outcomes and conversion rates. And they will see their outcome. And then all the other dots are those of other surgeons, obviously anonymized, so they can see where they fit against other surgical practitioners or their unit against other units. Also use QSIM analysis. Um, which actually both gives us a, the learning curves for the new surgeons and in people who've been operating for a while, make sure that they're operating within a safe framework um, and we can pick up with the, any outliers. So good for the hospital, good for the patients, good for the surgeons. Um, as a company, we've been um, relatively busy. Um, we started in 2014. I was previously head of gynecology here at Addenbrooke's in Cambridge. Um, the wooden arm prototype we used to show early investors. We got our first um, CE mark in 2019, raised um, quite a lot of money in that year. We went, um, our first cases were in India in 2019, introduced to the NHS in 29, November 2019, Australia 2020, <coughs> France in 2020. And by soon after that, we've done over a thousand um, clinical cases, and we're now very close to having done um, 5,000 clinical cases. A lot of people question whether we are a young and small company. In 2021, we raised $660 million in funding, which is the biggest private med tech raise in history. And we've got some of the bigger players um, in the world of med tech investment as our backers. Um, so I think we have a lot of stability and we're here to stay. Um, we have expanded globally um, hugely. We now have um, robots in most of Europe, um, in India, Pakistan, the Middle East, um, in Australia and um, in South America, having gone live in Brazil um, earlier this week where they've already done 10 um, cases. So it's been a long and very um, fast journey for us. Our aim was to introduce more minimal access surgery by the means of a robotic system. I think we're showing that this is possible. We underline all of this with a commitment to research. 
of which we've done a lot. We have multiple publications. Everything we do, we publish preclinical, clinical, and post-marketing. We have a commitment to education, and we have an enormous commitment to technology. Um, and, and we even have telemetry now, which can distinguish between um, expert and um, novice users. Um, so this will be something else in the future where we can help monitor proficiency, expertise, and training. So very excited to be here. Um, sorry we can't join you in Dublin today. I'd extend a very warm welcome to anybody wanting to find out more about our robot. As I said, we work in all the major disciplines um, from head and neck down to the pelvis. And, and we'd be delighted to see you ask your question, answer your questions and share with you um, what we're doing. Um, clinical progress in Europe, this is, just to give you a rough idea of what we're doing, a um, lot of colorectal, general gynecology, but we're pretty much in all areas now. And most recently, we've moved into thoracic where the system performs um, particularly well. We've done a lot of thoracic cases. So thank you for your time. I think it's just about 15 minutes now. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions later. Bye-bye. Mark, thank you very much. Um, it sounds like you haven't slept for the last four years. Um, I don't know how you do it. That, that was some tour de force. It was amazing, uh, hugely impressive. And uh, congratulations. And what I really like about what you've done is the fact that you've published all your work as you go along, your preclinical, your clinical and your post marketing uh, data, which is really, really uh, makes it very transparent and um, very believable. So thank you very much. Um, we'll move along as we have a number of speakers. Um, and our next speaker is Mr. Rick Mangat, who's CEO of Trafrox Technologies. And uh, Rick is uh, going to deliver his talk on From Bench to Standard of Care, the ups and downs of medical device entrepreneurship and the opportunities for clinicians. Thank you. Great, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Ronan. Uh, let me just get my screen pulled up here. Hopefully you can see my screen now, Paul. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for the invite today. Um, I'm coming to you from Toronto, Canada. And uh, when Professor Cahill had asked me to speak, um, he'd really asked me to talk about some of my experience I've worked with clinicians all over the world, and I just feel there's tremendous opportunity for whether you're a new graduate or a seasoned clinician or surgeon who's been out there a while to really get involved with industry and work with us to bring kind of the next uh, level of medical devices and um, in the next 20, 30 years to market. And so I'll speak a little bit about my experience. And then also just where I see the opportunities and some of the ups and downs that I faced um, going forward. So it, for myself, <clears throat> the journey really began in 1996. I was doing my PhD here in pharmacology in Canada. And it was a backup project to my PhD, which was to look at blood flow in uh, mice and rats so that I could study the effects of different types of drugs on the heart. And as I started doing this, I needed to develop a technique to do it. And I looked at some work being done in the eye with this imaging agent called endocyanin green. And I adapted it to the animal model that I needed in the heart. <clears throat> and it worked well. I ended up presenting it at some conferences. And I had some cardiac surgeons come up to me and said, look, is this something you could do for us in the operating room? Could you actually help us look at graph patency? And so, you know, I was a student, I'm like, sure, I can do it. And so we ended up doing some larger animal models in the pig, and it showed very well. So it was basically, if you wanted to look at blood flow, we had a good mechanism for you to do it. And then at the same time, I had the business group come to me at the university and say, we're entering some business plan competitions, you know, we like the business side, but we have no ideas, but you guys on the science side seem to have the ideas. So can we put something together? So we put together a presentation and I actually ended up going and presenting it down at some US um, uh, business plan competitions. And uh, lo and behold, we ended up winning a few of these. And so when I came back to Canada, um, <clears throat> you know, it, it gets in the newspapers and uh, an investor, a family investor out of Winnipeg heard about it and uh, we met for lunch and he offered me $2 million if I would 
start a company that was back in 1999 in order to move the technology forward. So, you know, it was great as a grad student coming out. Um, I kind of had my first job and the money to do it. And then really the journey's been, uh, I thought wasn't going to be as long at the time, but it was a journey from being totally a private company back in 2000 to going public um, in 2005 and then 2008 on the NASDAQ and then being purchased by Stryker Corporation back in uh, September of 2017. So during that period, what we were really involved in was every aspect of trying to bring a product to market. And I would say it wasn't just bringing a product and developing a product, we also had to develop a market. And you know, this is one of the lessons I would say to a lot of you as clinicians or anyone looking to bring a medical device when you're having to develop the market too, it's extremely difficult and you're going to have probably 98% of naysayers who are basically going to be telling you, this isn't going to work. We don't need it. When I started off, um, you know, I was being told, look, it's kind of cool. Fluorescence is neat. We get it, but we don't need it in the operating room. And, you know, they, we really don't have a great need for looking at blood flow, et cetera. It, to me, as a non-surgeon or clinician, it really made no sense. Um, I was looking at the surgeries that um, uh, these colleagues were doing, and I was like, you know, how can you do this so blindly? Wouldn't it help you to have more confidence? Wouldn't it help you to have more guidance in doing your procedures? So we continued. And, um, you know, some people can say it was stupid, but at the time, um, you know, we just had a passion for trying to fulfill this, what we thought was a need, even if others didn't. And so we moved through really the key elements beyond just coming up with a device, which were regulatory. And for regulatory back in, for us in the early 2000s, it was very difficult. Today, you have a large number of combination products where you have a drug and a device. At the time, the Office of Combination Products had just been set up in the United States at the FDA. And you know it was interesting. And I would go to all of these meetings directly myself and I remember them telling me that they had more people looking at our product than drug eluding stents at the time. And it kind of worried me because I don't think it's ever a good thing to have that many regulatory people looking at anything. But um, anyhow, well, we worked through it. We worked through with the FDA, with CE Mark, with the European and international authorities. And in the end, they all worked with us to bring the product to market. Next, we looked at the health economics and reimbursement. And, you know, I would say for all of you, the clinical aspect um, is very important, of course, and without that, you don't have anything. But what I would say to you is without the health economics and reimbursement, it is extremely difficult today to bring a product to market. I think everyone talks about we have a great clinical product and it will save you money. Very few have very good data showing that will actually save money. And this was an area we invested in a lot. We knew we had the clinical, but then we actually spent significantly to go show that we actually had the economic data versus what was doing current, what was being done currently. And then the final piece was intellectual property. And again, I got involved quite heavily in that, both in Europe, attending all the meetings, as well as in the US and Washington. And we were able to get some good patents uh, around the technology. Um, one of the first clinical cases we had was actually in the United Kingdom, was in Oxford, uh, was a gentleman, David Taggart at Oxford University, who was interested in, in that initial application of cardiac surgery and looking at graft patency. And so this was me with him and the OR doing our first case. And <clears throat> it really kind of grew from there into all the different applications. As you can see on this slide, <clears throat> we started with what we called our open surgery system which is on the left. We did a deal with Intuitive Surgical, which today every intuitive, intuitive Surgical robot has our technology incorporated into it for the fluorescence imaging. <coughs> Sorry. And then we developed a tower for endoscopic, as well as a handheld version that plugged into that tower as well. And so we really went through a whole host of kind of technology advancements and it continues today at Stryker. I mean, they're doing tremendous. They have our entire team at, in Vancouver still moving this area forward and really kind of propelling where fluorescence can bring value to surgery. When just before we sold to Stryker, so in 2016, this was a slide that I had, sorry. 
where basically <clears throat> at the time we had over 2,500 uh, systems in use around the world. We were in all the top cancer uh, centers, especially in the United States, and we were expanding it into Europe, Asia, and South America. We were in multiple over 75 different documented applications, <coughs> uh, multiple specialties. And today, I think now with Stryker, there are over, I believe, 350 publications with very strong data, again, around the economic and how the reduction of complications was really, really leading to a reduction in costs and bringing value to the healthcare system. So this kind of gives you an idea of, you know, a lot of people say, well, I just want to sell my business or sell my technology to someone. This is what it took for us to sell. You know, a lot of people would say to me, oh, you're really lucky 17 years and you sold this thing for like a billion Canadian or whatever it was. And what I would say is, well, we had to do all of this. Now, that doesn't mean you have to do that in every case, but that's what we ended up doing. <coughs> I apologize, I'm just recovering from a really bad flu. But um, so, you know, if you're a clinician, what I would say is, what do you need to focus on? I would say the first piece is the clinical impact and the healthy economics. I would say both of these need to be a given, and you really need to spend time on that and understand how exactly does your technology um, affect both of them. <clears throat> Secondly, how do you eliminate any regulatory risk? You need to be able to show that you can get approval in the major markets, so Europe, Asia, North America, and you need to show what is the pricing model going to be. You know, if you're expecting a company to step up and take over this technology and take it global for you, they need to understand how much are we going to make off it? How big is the market? Is there any regulatory risk left? And how are we going to sell it? <coughs> In terms of ups and downs for myself, it really was multiple. And these are just a few. I'd say the first one, which is an up, is when you raise money and you get a venture investor. But then you have to deal with that venture investor. And, you know, some people have different thoughts on your technology. They have different timelines of how they got to return money to their shareholders. And so it can be a very positive thing. But at the same time, you know, raising money is, all, or, um, is not always the best thing going forward in terms of where you take your product. So you want to be careful. Secondly, going on the public markets, it gets you a lot of exposure. You're out there. You get a lot of access, again, to funding, which we did. And... Um, the only thing is you're now fully accountable to the public market and their timelines. <coughs> As I mentioned with regulatory, it can be a, a difficult path depending whether you have a similar product that's been approved or not, as well as with intellectual property. I'd say one of the biggest things are the pessimists. I think you're going to hear, and a lot of times, especially from your own colleagues, just that why something's not needed or why something's not going to work. And this is the part where you've really got to kind of look at yourself and you've got to look at the data and you've got to look at wh what we're bringing, what kind of value is it really adding to what's being done here? And that's something I always kept going back to when I'd meet with surgeons, whether they were reconstructive surgeons, cardiac surgeons, colorectal surgeons, general surgeons, when they would challenge me and say, we don't need it, I would always go that next two, three levels and with the questions of, okay, what have you changed in this procedure? What are your complication rates? Um, have you been doing this thing for the same way for the last 30 years? And if so, why? Is it just great? Or is there room for improvement? <clears throat> and so I'd say to you, don't be blind to the pessimists, but you really do need to look out, um, is what they're telling you reflected in the data? The next one is competition. <coughs> Again, sorry, when we started um, with uh, Novodak, there was no one in this field. We were the only ones coming in with fluorescence imaging. Other companies were starting to dabble in it around 2005, 2007. And really by about 2012, you had all the major players looking at it, whether it was Medtronic, Stryker, Storz, Olympus, um, uh, Intuitive Surgical. Everyone was realizing that, you know what, lo and behold, there seemed to be a need for fluorescence imaging. And we grew to where I believe now, you know, there's millions of procedures being done every year globally using ICG fluorescence. And so at the beginning, it was a little bit scary when you have these large multinationals coming and you're this small company, but at the same time, it really validates what you have. And the advice that I give a lot of entrepreneurs is, the one difference that you can have is just being so ahead of everyone on the technology. 
And I can tell you when we sold to Stryker, I had indicated to them when they bought us, <clears throat> and they, I think they saw this, we were at least somewhere four to five years ahead of anyone else in the field. And they've been now been able to maintain that as well. We have, as I mentioned, tremendous groups out on the West Coast in Vancouver and San Jose who continue to work on making sure that they keep that gap on technology and staying ahead of the competition. And so with that, um, you know, what I would say to you is, if you have an idea, first of all, clearly document it, um, seek some early IP protection. Don't go spend a huge amount of money here. File a provisional patent so that you give yourself a year at a relatively low cost to kind of um, put your strategy together. Map out a path to bring it to proof of concept. Now, this may involve working with your tech transfer office locally at the university or finding a strategic partner, whether it's a striker or a Medtronic or, or a J&J, and saying, is this of value to you? That's usually a little bit difficult at the earlier stage, but again, it can be doable. Answer the key, key questions, especially around clinical and economic, the regulatory sales potential, and then dive into every aspect of the business. You know, I hear from a lot of people, well, I'm a surgeon or I'm the, an engineer or I'm this, you know, so I don't get that. Well, you need to understand it all. And that, that's going to help you enjoy what you're doing, I believe, a lot more too. When I, when I was involved in the business, I was a pharmacologist. And so, you know, but I got involved in the engineering. I went to the FDA. I went to the panels in Europe, both around the um, intellectual property and regulatory. <clears throat> I got involved in every single aspect. And that's what it takes to bring something to market. And then I think another thing that often happens is <coughs> people try to say, well, he's just a doctor or a clinician or a surgeon. He can't be a CEO. I think being a founder who runs the company is can be extremely useful. Now, if you clearly don't have the personality for it, I understand that. But I think if you can be the CEO or the person leading what you're doing and you can bring together an experienced team with you, there's absolutely nothing like it. And I can tell you as you move forward, whether it's with the VCs or selling your company, no one's going to be able to explain that better than you will be able to. So don't always take this thing that just because you're a scientist or a clinician that you can't run the, uh, the company because you don't have a business experience. You can bring that business experience around you. So again, thank you very much to Professor Carhill and um, uh, Professor Renman for inviting me to this. And I look forward to any questions at the end of the session. Thank you. And I again, apologize for the cough. Uh, Rick, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, it's really interesting. Mark, I'm gonna ask you, bring you, ask you to switch on your video too, please. If you're still there, maybe we'll just have a chat after the last two talks together. Mark, are you okay there? Rick, I guess my first point in contradiction or in, in contrast, Mark is the chief medical officer, uh, whereas you're the CEO, and they're two quite different roles, aren't they? For you know, to continue to practice as a doctor, do you think it's possible to be a CEO? Or actually is the chief medical officer role maybe better suited if you're if you're not going to kind of leave your job and move full time into this uh, startup run? Absolutely. Um, yeah, I would say, you know, if you are, if you're not, if you can't leave full time, then you're not going to be able to do it. The job, the CEO job and anyone giving you money, their money to invest is going to be looking to you to be yeah. full time. And so, no, it's a good point. I think the CMO role fits well for some practicing uh, physicians. Our CMO at the time at Novidac was a practicing physician. It was actually a requirement we had that they had to be active in surgery while they were working with us because I find that some companies take on people who've had tremendous careers and it all looks good on paper, but then when you actually bring them in as a CMO, they're not up to date on what's going on out there. And so I think that thing of having them active in the field, at least from our perspective, was always very important. And then, you know, I think there's a lot of areas where we worked on certain projects just with where they weren't even our CMO, but, you know, like yourself, when we looked at colorectal, you know, we, we had people working with you to kind of look at a specific problem and try to come up with a solution. And so, you know, there, there's different models people can take depending on the amount of involvement they want with industry. But what I would tell you is there's just tremendous opportunity for your colleagues out there. And I would say in Europe, 
they're not taking advantage of it as much as people have done so in the United States. I think um, maybe they're more capitalistic in the United States, but I would just say you've actually, like us in Canada, have a better system to work with industry. You know, industry doesn't have the tremendous costs in working in Europe or in North, in Canada, um, just because the health, the way the healthcare systems are set up. And so we like to work with clinicians in those sectors. Yeah. yeah I mean, Mark, to, answer, to answer that question, I mean, the absolutely no reason why um, the inventor can't be the CEO. Um, I started with four colleagues. Um, and we just made a concept. One of I was the medic, one was a physicist, one was an engineer, one was a computer scientist, and one was a businessman. So the businessman won the game, and we, you know, he be, he became the CEO. But he and we didn't work as as at that stage. So a lot of what Rick said, I, I thought he'd been stealing my slides because what he said just resonates so very very strongly with many of my own things. The naysayers are the worst. If I could quote one person who told me I was wasting my time. I can quote you a hundred, um, you know, and, um, you know, people really try and put you off. But, but yes, um, I see, I, I do give a bit of advice and I'd support Rick there. If you start your own company, try and stay as the CEO. Um, it's, 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 you know, but of course, once you bring in bigger and bigger investors, that becomes tricky as well. You know, you get diluted, they have their own opinion, they want to scale things. So yeah, but it's a great journey. Um, and, and, and I largely um, completely um, um, agree with what Rick said in, in so many, many ways. And, and the other one as well is, is IP, do protect it. Don't spend a fortune. I've just written an article for the RCS on IP protection and, and um, yeah, a great journey. So, Rick, the Novodak story, you had to make a market because there was no one using fluorescence before you started to make it useful. And, Mark, you, there was an incumbent in your technology space. Neither of those sound like they're easy things to do, to either make a market um, or to actually come into a market where there's been a monopoly. Have you got, got any comments either for each other or on your, on your own perspectives on that? Yeah, I mean, you know, my take would be I, I always found, found it extremely hard when you're trying to create a market. But I can tell you, if I was in Mark's shoes against Intuitive, I don't know if I would have, I think I would have maybe rather made a market. But, you know, at the same time, I think, you know, what Mark and them are doing at Cambridge, what's so tremendous there is they realize the solution is not there. If the solution was already there, we'd be at more than 3% of procedures being done robotically. <clears throat> you know, so it clearly is not there. Someone needs something better to come to the market, and that's what they're trying to do. And so, you know, it, it's it's impressive. And I think from what I've seen and heard about them, I think they're going to get it done. I mean, one of the things that's really important, Rick said it very clearly as well, is get the data. So we did all our preclinical work, but we're also collecting data on the value added. What actually will we save? What will be the benefit of our system? And actually, so we have proof of it, and we're actually employing health economists and so on. Yeah, I'm going up against a big company like Intuitive. I got asked that question, Ronan, um, a while ago. Now, you know, if they've made a $120 billion company out of a 3% share of the market, I reckon there's a bit of space for the rest of us. And that's more than just one. And then the other question was, how did we in Cambridge, a little company in Cambridge, think we could cope against these big companies? And I, I said at the time, I would have to look at the track record in Cambridge. And I think in the past we've discovered the neutron, the electron, nuclear fission, the jet engine, IVF. So we've done okay in the past. I think we might do okay this time. Sure. So, I mean, both of you are sort of getting into an area of kind of data-driven surgery, aren't you? And maybe decision support rather than just dexterity. The last century, the instruments were all just about trying to get an extra degree of movement. Rick, you, you, you're really getting into something decision support. Mark, you didn't really talk about dexterity of the... Of the robot. It was more about the data uh, aggregation capabilities of it and tracking surgeons or optimizing the surgical use of the system. Is, is that fair? So, um, I mean, the dexterity is very important. You know, we've got seven degrees of freedom at the instrument tip. Um, we've got 3D um, vision. We've got, um, you know, all the other advantages, magnification of vision. Sure. So on. We've also but got... We, well, we with respect, that didn't that didn't really shift outcomes in Correct. the system. So that's, so one of, that, you have to have that, but maybe that's not enough to really- uh, No, really it's not. Over. 
so data becomes a big one. So you have a registry of outcomes and we also have telemetry. So for example, we've already got the telemetry. We've taught it what a basic surgeon is and what an advanced surgeon looks like. And it was able, we did 16 patients, 16 surgeries, seven novices, I mean, eight novices, eight um, experts. And the machine was able to identify seven out of the eight novices, one of whom was rather good and was able to identify seven out of the eight experts. And you know what I'm going there. One, when we looked at the videos, wasn't that good. So that's a pointer to the future. If machines can then look at what you're doing and actually comment on your ability, your dexterity and so on, that is a pointer towards improvement. And then the other thing about data, having a registry has a Hawthorne effect. People improve because they concentrate more because they know to a point they're being watched. And I think, Ronan, you know, from my perspective, I mean, obviously the data is important and then looking, at, making sure you're looking at the right data too. And, I, you know, I think what's important in Mark's presentation that I liked was one of my biggest critiques, even when we worked with Intuitive was, stop telling me how the robot's better than an open procedure. You know, all the data you would keep seeing was comparison of a robot to an open procedure. And I'm like, but that's not what we're trying to do here. If you're trying to improve this, you need to improve minimally invasive surgery is what you need to improve. And I think that's a critical part of it. So, you know, as you hear these new technologies come out and they present this data to you, you'd really need to kind of question it. What are they comparing? And then what is the value that they're bringing? And then I would say with everything we're doing in AI and I'm involved in some of these technologies now, it's exactly what Mark's saying. They're gonna have this robot here. It's gonna be seeing what you're doing. It's gonna be giving you ideas based on a data bank of millions of procedures of, look, this is maybe where you're missing something or, you know, for us in fluorescence, it was just a simple thing in general surgery where surgeons said, I just want to be able to see the critical view. Can you just light it up for me and show it to me? And I was like, what do you mean you want to see? What have you been looking at up to now? And they're like, well, I kind of find it like this. And so one, you know, when you bring these solutions, I think that's where you see, you're going to see tremendous value as we go forward. I think this is great. There's a, there's a question about data and oh ownership but we might come back to the end because i think that's going to be a common theme to all the talks um paul have you, have you got any, any comments i think it's great to hear these guys no uh, i mean i i, I both of those talks were were hugely impressive but i think the individuals delivering those talks are even more impressive and um what, what i love about those are that ye both of you took took that fear factor of getting out of a stereotypic position in pharmacology and in gynecology and said, I'm going to do something different and I'm going to have the balls to do this. And I really admire that. And I, and I want to know what both of you think when you're sitting in your office on a Monday morning at 6 a.m. and things aren't going well and how you how you maintain your self-belief to say, um, there's, there's 600 emails that say what you're doing is crap and you say, no, I can do this. I can maintain this. I know I'm not doing the job I trained to do, but I can still make this work as a CMO or a CEO. And how we can, in, in that lateral thinking box, how we can, if you like, strengthen ourselves to have the belief to do different things with our lives, which can actually impact on patient outcomes, et cetera. Could I ask maybe either of you to comment on that? Okay. Um... So when um, I was being interviewed by one of the BBC people, they asked me what's difficult about building a robot. And the answer is everything. And the second part of that was if I'd known now what I knew then, I wouldn't have started. Um, it, it takes a thick skin sometimes and it takes an enormous amount of energy. Um, but, but, but it's also incredibly enjoyable. I loved hearing um, the Novadic story, um, one of the things I've followed academically for a long time is, is ICG. Um, and to hear it from the originator is just such a privilege. Um, and yes, there were so many nearsayers when I was trying to get to the hospital to buy ICG, the number of people that told me it was valueless. And now, you know, if you don't have it on your system, you're, you're not in the game. Uh, no, thanks, Mark. And, you know, I think when I look back, and as I mentioned, I say this a lot when I speak to people, including my kids, is it was probably the 17 best years I had. You know, I made, <clears throat> it was the most difficult without a doubt. You know, I was traveling 250 of 365 days a year. Uh, we had young kids. And, um, but, you know, where I was fortunate, I was meeting, I always say the benefit we have in this space is you will meet the best people in the world. 
whether it's engineers, whether it's clinicians, sometimes whether it's even the patients that we got to meet out there. And so, you know, to me, that was always a privilege. I think the part that gets difficult for people is they sometimes just give up a little early. And it's often that they'll do 80 to 90% of the work and you know, they're almost there. And then things go wrong and they're told, you know, it's stupid or they're told that, you know, we want to go in a different direction. And so, you know, my thing always to everyone I speak in this space is just have that mantra, never give up. And it sounds easy. And, you know, when you sit there on a Monday morning, you know, the chairman of our board, whenever we'd have issues, he was always like, Rick, it's so bad. So it can only get better. And that's how you got to look at it. And, you know, the other thing I used to say to people was they'd always be like, yeah, but we've got like a hundred problems. I'm like, that's a good thing to have a hundred problems because if you've got one problem, it's a big problem and that's going to be trouble for you. So I'd always say to you, it's good to have a lot of problems. As long as they're all these little ones, you can kind of manage them. But, you know, you don't want that big one. Well, and the, the other fun thing, Ronan, is that um, when we were raising our money, they do due diligence and they brought surgeons in to ask us questions. And one of the bankers in New York brought a surgeon in and he spent an hour questioning me. And at the end, he said, thank you so much. That's been fantastic. Tell me, where did you study your surgery? I said, I'm about to ruin your day. I'm a gynecologist. <laughs> Think of that for any of your many kind of research achievements. Did you ever think about exploring putting them into an, a, a startup? It's a bit difficult in the university some, sometime. Yeah, one, oh, that was a one thing that was said earlier, which I would say, so in my past, I've taken two or three um, um, products to global launch before, and I did it by going through major pharmaceutical companies. Um, and they were my first three inventions they were their three millionth entrepreneur coming to them. And believe me, the um, deal I got wasn't that great. So that's why when we started with this one, I didn't go near anybody. We, we, I gave 600 talks, I reckon, trying to raise money. I even gave a talk. I even took a billionaire's widow out for lunch. But halfway through the lunch, I realized while I was looking for money, she had a completely different agenda. So unfortunately... <laughs> We didn't get the money, but but one of the things to be careful, when I went to the pharma companies, I was so excited that they liked my um, inventions, which they took to global launch, that I actually, I didn't get a massively good financial deal. Thank you, Ronald. We should probably move on. Yeah. Um, so our next speaker is Dr. George, uh, George uh, Murgatroyd, uh, who is general manager and vice president for uh, digital surgery Medtronic. And he's going to talk to us for the next 15 minutes or so about the sur surgery on the edge of the cloud, the era of digital tools custom built for surgeons. Thank you. Thanks so much, Paul. Uh, and it's great to be here. Paul, I think you said about Mark, it seemed like he hadn't slept for four years. I've got a three-year-old, a six-year-old, and we just got a three-month-old puppy. So I, I literally feel like I haven't slept <laughs> four years. But there we go. I've never taken a, a billionaire's widow out for lunch either. Um, I'm going to change uh, tack a little bit. I'm going to talk about, um, I think, some of the opportunity here. And, and I really do think um, within the surgery space, we're on the brink of some really remarkable innovation. You've heard um, from Mark, you've heard from Rick um, about the work ongoing. Um, I'm part of digital surgery, um, which was brought into the Medtronic organization around two years ago. I'm going to take you through some of the way uh, I perceive uh, this shift within surgery, talk through a case study of how we've tried to solve some problems, which I, I think brings to life some of the opportunity um, of uh, the fact we are in the 21st century uh, rather than the 20th century. Um, I think a lot about uh the consumer technology that has transformed our lives at home uh and comparing that and contrasting that to some of the technology we have in the operating room and, and in the hospital um so this is just an example I, I suppose there are other ecosystems available but from an apple perspective uh, the work they did to combine connect make super convenient and continually improve um what used to be very disconnected technology, um, devices that didn't talk to each other, and an experience um, uh, that was not user 
friendly. And it's not so long ago um, that we used to have digital cameras, um, phones, DVD players, CD players, um, readers, computers, game systems. We, we have within a few years moved to a very different um, realm where almost every industry that we used to have to go to has come to our phone, has come to our home. Um, there is such tremendous opportunity um, within surgery um, to bring this same thinking. And I think um, Rick and Mark have, have, have touched on some of this. But I think if you think about an operating room, you think about um, the PAC scans, uh, the uh, energy devices, the instrumentation, the scheduling, the EMR systems, um, the video screens that laparoscopic surgeons look at. Um, we are on the cusp of uh, bringing a much better user experience to surgeons that start doing more convenient, connected and consumer level, but medical grade um, value um, across and leveraging things like edge computing, um, leveraging things like AI, but ultimately are going to drive improvements for the surgeon experience and drive improvements as surgeons and their teams perform operations. I look at this slide a lot. Um, this is Apple. It's slightly depressing because um, I think it often gives you a sense of how much money you've actually spent on Apple over the years. Um, but this is their development from 1976 through to the products they brought to market. Um, it gives you a sense of the continual development of technology at the speed at which we've worked. And some things that I think are so important here at, at the bottom left, the iOS operating system, uh, I think around 2008 and the App Store um, around the same time. And then the iCloud, the development of the software and infrastructure within the Apple ecosystem has been absolutely critical to how all of their devices connect. Um, I sometimes ask surgeons and surgical teams where their most powerful computer in the operating room sits on this chart. Uh, is it the 1994 PowerBook 150? Uh, or do we have computing power in the operating room, which is really at the level we have in our home? And often, alas, uh, a lot of the computers are more 20th century uh, computing power, more 20th century than 21st century. But the thing that is really positive about this for organizations like my own, um, uh, organizations um, like Marx and Ricks and others is that we are leveraging all of the pioneering work that tech companies um, like Apple and others have done to be able to start leapfrogging technology and bringing um, uh, and start bringing technology that leverages a lot of this learning, leverages a lot of the opportunities of cloud edge computing and putting them in surgeons' hands. Um, this is the question I, I ask surgeons. I asked the hundred and 45 uh, people on this call um, to get in touch with me uh, from a surgical perspective, from a scrub nurse perspective, um, what do you wish you could instantly access with almost no effort in the OR? Uh, it's a question um, we pose um, because there are so many things at the moment within the operating room um, which have not got a good user experience for surgeons and surgical teams. Um, but there are so many things that if you could improve the user experience, have the potential to radically transform um, surgeon experience and therefore potential to transform um, patient care, patient outcomes and the experience of patients. And I'm just going to give you in the next seven minutes, I think, an example of, of one answer we got from this question and how we've developed technology to um, solve for it. And it brings to life some of the differences, I suppose, of, of the Apple technology and the consumer pers perspective and developing technology within the medical space. Um, so this is uh, around five years ago, um, what surgeons uh, started to say to us as one of those, what do you just wish you could have at your fingertips? Um, surgeon said, I'd like to review the operation I've just performed from anywhere. I want to watch the case back and I want to do that seamlessly um, and without uh, almost any effort. This is a quote from a, a surgeon um, out in Boston uh, in the US um, who, who said this phrase to me. He said, uh, blockbuster still exists around my operating room. Uh, to which he meant to get the video of his operation, he had to go to the media room where they would burn a DVD um, and pass him that DVD 
which he then had to find a DVD player to, to watch the procedure back. Um, every day we encounter surgeons who, uh, across laparoscopy, across robotic surgery, are having blocks and hurdles to simply reviewing their cases, to simply learning and accessing the data on the cases that have been performed. Um, we had a, a, a call last week, and this was good, um, of a surgeon who said in order to get her video um, at one of her hospital sites, she had to check out a camcorder to record the screen within the operating room uh, so she could get the actual footage because there was no other way. Um, it's 2022. Um, and I do think when we think about this consumer perspective, these sorts of examples are routine or normalized within the operating room, within surgery, but really shouldn't be. So how do we solve for getting things simple like this, a video straight into the hands of surgeons, wherever they are, um, with zero effort? Firstly, um, Amazon solved this uh, uh, in terms of uh, asking about the weather and trying to order something by building a computer. We did exactly the same thing, building a computer for surgery, an edge computer, leveraging the technology um, that so many consumer products um, leverage today. Um, medicine, um, surgery is so important to protect patient data. I know uh, um, developing algorithms that can um, redact footage when a lap laparoscopic camera is taken out of a patient. Um, simple things um, that make the video usable, um, which actually technically are quite difficult, are, are the types of things um, our organization works on to make a seamless experience occur and give surgeons and give surgeons team teams easy access um, and safe and secure access to footage without them having to do anything, without them having to expend effort. Um, it's been really important for us to build technology which can plug into any laparoscopic or robotic OR. Um, not build technology which is only served for gynecology, only served for robotics, um, building technology which is agnostic that plugs and plays exactly as you expect in your home to be able to come in and plug in an Alexa, come in and, and have a, a, uh, someone in, install a, a broadband router, whether they're from Virgin, whether they're from um, EE. And that doesn't happen that often, but the opportunity here, and I think that it's a really big opportunity in digital, is that the plug and play element opens up the opportunity for technology to be installed in operating rooms, regardless of their legacy equipment, regardless of their legacy technology they've got, as long as they have connectivity to the internet, as long as they have power, and as long as um, uh, they have space for the technology. It's been really important to make our technology super usable on app, on Android, on iOS, um, on web, uh, to enable as few clicks as possible for the user to be able to do what they want two taps to download, one tap to share, one tap to jump to different um, parts of the procedure, two taps to add an annotation. Um, these are really important aspects that technology companies think about and have been too slow to be absorbed, I think, into surgery, um, particularly when you think about some of the legacy software providers um, that you all, I think, have to work with. Um, and really importantly, I, I showed that diagram on, on, uh, on Apple's uh, development, keep making it better. Um, there is an expectation that I think surgeons and surgical teams rightly have that they will not be sold a product uh, today uh, within their operating room that they use that stays static for five years and never gets updated. Um, we launch and deploy updates to our products um, almost every day uh, and we communicate with our surgeons uh, constantly in terms of the updates. That expectation is there, it's understandable. Um, it's palpable, and I think um, it's important that we serve it. Um, there was talk of, of, of outcomes um, and value. Um, and I do believe that the ease of use in surgery, making things easier for surgeons, which they have difficulty in performing today, has the real potential to be transformative. And I do think that ease of use, that user-friendly way, the zero effort um, user experience has been underplayed. And that has led to opportunities being missed for surgeons to improve, to review, to share. Um, this is a quote from James Clark, a upper GI and bariatric surgeon in England. Um, we deployed the video to technology. Uh, and this is words from his mouth in terms of extraordinary improvements in governance, surgical training and patient safety, just from making access to video 
seamless and secure. And I do think um, there are so many opportunities um, to do the same, whether it's with scheduling, whether it's with EMR integration, whether it's with video, um, that will unlock um, opportunities left, right and centre for improvements in surgery. And just finally, uh, I know I'm at time, um, uh, we're moving to make insight easy. Um, we're moving to build analytics with surgeons on their cases, I know Mark touched on this, but automatically. Um, uh, developing um, analysis to enable surgeons to understand better their cases. Um, and it's worth mentioning, um, we've already started publication. I know, Ronan, you published a paper already uh, on decision support and cancer surgery. And we've published on things like neurosurgery in terms of the automatic analysis and opportunities that this heralds. Um, and we continue to ask this question, what could, uh, what could we do uh, to improve your experience um, with instant access, with almost zero effort. Um, and finally, I think there was a question, Renan, you raised in terms of decision support. Um, this is coming. Um, uh, we deployed automated AI in the operating room two years ago. Uh, it's something um, where there is tremendous opportunity to support surgeons and their teams leveraging uh, the latest technology. And just to give you a snippet here, I know there was a, a uh, um, uh, comment from, from Rick on um, uh, fluoroscopy and um, uh, on um, uh, ICG. Um, this is the opportunity here to start leveraging, and this is work within um, the digital surgery team, to start providing AI-powered um, ICG, quote unquote, to start analyzing the surgical scene for surgeons and giving them support as they operate. Um, this is what we presented uh, uh, globally now. It's work that's ongoing. And this gives you, I think, a sense of the path to real-time assistance that is coming. Um, there are very complex problems like this to solve. There are very uh, fundamental problems that almost every surgeon faces to solve. And I think uh, it's so great to see so many organizations, so many leaders and so many companies working on this. I will stop there, Ronan, uh, hand back to you or Paul and um, uh, open to any questions or we move on to the next presenter. Uh, George, that's great. Thank you very much. I think there's going to be some questions about data ownership and even the possibility of autonomous operations. We might just leave them towards the, the, the end, perhaps. George, can I, I, one question for you, though. You were at the startup touch sur surgery and different to Rick and Mark's story, you moved to the technology into Medtronic, an enormous company, which I guess brings the opportunity of scale. But I, is, it, is it hard to keep your identity, or how do you how how does the little guy influence the big the big company to uh, to make these things a a a re reality? Yeah, and it's a good question, um, Ronan. And I think um, um, one of the aspects which is, is really important, which I guess was my driver, is that the implementation of technology to support improvement and support the next phase of surgical development is the focus of so many companies. Um, and the ability to integrate it into organizations like Medtronic, which have decades long experience of providing medical devices, working with surgeons and developing capital equipment is so great um, that um, uh, I think there is a, a real drive from leadership in very large companies to incubate and protect um, and grow this type of um, uh, organization because the combination of digital and the combination of medical devices is, is clearly the next phase um, to some extent in, in, in improvements in surgery. Um, I also have no problem keeping my identity, Ronan. <laughs> you managed to get me in a, in a shirt today, but otherwise I'd be wearing a hoodie. Um, uh, but I thought I'd, I thought I'd formalise um, for this session. Um, but I, I think we, we are, you know, in 2022, 2021, we were acquired two years ago. I think the driver is, is such that organisations, startups are being adopted. And I think there is as much listening to startups um, as startups are being asked to listen to by, by their acquirers. Okay, cool. Paul, we might move, move on and come back to the, to the data bits and uh, at the end. Yeah, absolutely. And our next talk is 
from Mr. Dennis O'Sullivan uh, from Stryker, and he's going to talk about sustainability innovation in the operating room. Very good. Thank you very much. So some great um, presentation so far. Very insightful, especially looking at the future and hoping everything is up on screen right now. Um, I just want to take uh, some time to talk about sustainability and environmental impact, um, and especially as we're talking about some uh, technologies here. So just to quickly introduce myself, I've been in Stryker 17 years, uh, started as an engineer working in uh, R&D, process development, and in manufacturing. And then I moved to the dark side, to the more commercial side, and moved to marketing, and now I lead a part of the business, <clears throat> which is Western Europe, uh, a business unit which focuses on some technologies I'm going to talk about here in a minute. Um, I think everybody knows um, Stryker. I think, um, obviously, from a, an implant, from a, a neuro, neuro tech point of view, but also from all the different types of uh, medical equipment they've got. Um, but I'm probably going to talk about a technology which very little people know about, and that's uh, something called Neptune. And it's, its impact it's had on, or it is having right now on the environment, even if it probably wasn't originally designed for that. Um, so what's the problem um, we're going to talk about really is about, it's about the effect that we're having on uh, on the environment. And I think in Ireland, we, we pride ourselves on being exporters. We're exporters of talent. We're exporters of uh, technologies, of people, of culture. Um, but we're probably one of the top exporters in the world when it comes to hazardous waste. And um, we don't, It's it's been a political issue in the past about incineration. Um, and uh, as a result, what happens, the majority of hazardous waste is exported out of the country into other European countries. I live in the Netherlands and it happens to be one of the major importers of Irish waste. And how does healthcare play a part in that? Well, uh, operating rooms um, generate one third of hospital waste. And uh, when we think about that, it's coming from any open procedure. There's uh, a lot of, uh, anytime you've got uh, obviously procedures and hazardous waste, but I'm going to focus a little bit more on, um, on uh, uh, liquid that comes out of, um, of, of these procedures. And any of these open procedures, liquid needs to be uh, dealt with in a certain way, and especially hazardous uh, material. So how is that uh, dealt with today? Well, traditional method is canisters, uh, suction, uh, fluid goes into the canister, and then a canister uh, full of uh, hazardous uh, fluid is either brought to a different part of the hospital um, with a, uh, a hardening agent, which turns into uh, solid um, waste and then goes on a journey and goes on a supply chain. Everybody's talking about supply chain today. Um, it's a hot topic. I'm trying to get goods, trying to get all different types of materials that we need in the world right now. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we've got a supply chain of uh, clinical waste coming out of the country which um, has many modes of transports um, to go on ships uh, and trucks and vans to go to another country to either be incinerated or to go into a landfill. Um, so with that, of course, is uh, people who have to deal with this in the, in the hospital, um, it's not very engaging. Nobody gets into healthcare to be able to uh, deal with, with clinical waste. And, um, and from a staff satisfaction point of view, and I think everybody's in a war for uh, getting employees and retaining staff and keeping staff happy. Um, this is a, a major aspect as well. Uh, and this is sometimes what actually happens. So either um, canisters get full, they explode, they overload. Um, they have to be watched all the time so that there isn't um, going to be um, canisters that are going to fill, uh, overfill too much and it's actually a resource requirement to have somebody watching these especially in high high volume or high flu cases but aside from that just even from a health and safety point of view and, and a lifting point of view um, and causing any sorts of issues this all has to be transported around the hospital as well and uh, liquid is actually and solidified liquid is actually quite heavy so, and of course there's an infection risk. So it might be a low 
um, occurrence rating, but still there's a risk. And any time there's a potential risk, it should um, the harm should be removed. And here's actually one of our customers who put this up in social media. And the, uh, the comment she had underneath it was just another day in the office on the right hand side. Um, so how, how does this relate to Ireland um, with the uh, with the waste that we're producing? So on the right hand side, you can see uh, cost for dealing with, with waste. Um, and it's in the hundreds of, of euros per tonne. But when it comes to incineration, um, it's in the thousands of euros. And this is uh, probably about three or four times higher than what it would be in Great Britain. Um, I get to see the costs in, in all the different countries in Europe and Ireland is on one end of the scale. And it's because of the supply chain that I mentioned already. And this has been uh, shipped around the place. Because of that, uh, the costs is, uh, is pretty high and it's, it's uh, thousands and tens of thousands of tons uh, every year. So does this have an environmental impact on what it is? Yes, it does. Um, if you think about, uh, we're, we're estimating about over 4,000 tons of, um, of um, solidified waste that is going to be exported out of the country and is either incinerated or put into a landfill. And that has a massive effect, not to mind the uh, supply chain costs. So um, something that was probably not designed for, uh, to be honest, not designed for a sustainability reason. It was designed for a health and safety reason. Um, but Neptune, which uh, has got technologies relating to smoke evacuation, but the main purpose of the machine is to uh, take fluid waste um, in very large inbuilt canisters, uh, 24 litres in total, uh, with specific uh, measurements and readouts as to the, the different volumes and liquids. And I'll talk about some future innovations that are coming as well. Um, but other uh, features as well, which uh, make surgery um, easier and better. And from a system point of view, there is a rover, which uh, sits in an operating room, a docking station, which is about one third of the size of the rover. And this needs to be plumbed and connected to the normal waste outlet and uh, a manifold, which allows eight different ports to be connected and uh, usage between um, quick usage between patients as well. And, and this whole system is like one sealed shut system, which there is no risk of hazardous material coming out and uh, potentially causing infection. So from a handling point of view, uh, from a risk point of view, uh, a lot lower than, than what we're used to. Obviously, uh, staff well-being, environmental impact, um, being uh, major areas of, of uh of concern and obviously efficiency savings and hospital um, time savings as well. So recognition um, and within the last year, there is uh, different awards that we've uh, received. Uh, one around from the NHS, um, a sustainability partnership award, just on the impact that this actually had in this in NHS over the last two years. Uh, and another, uh, the greenest hospital uh, in the, the world, greenest hospital, which is a, a fictional digital hospital in uh, the Nordics, which is um, looking at different technologies, uh, thinking about the future and thinking about what technologies are really going to have an impact on the, the green side of healthcare. And uh, Neptune uh, being one of those technologies that was accepted for that. Customer impact. Uh, Lots of different um, posts, social media over the last year or two, stuff that we've never really asked for. But um, when we think about people looking for, uh, and this is across continental Europe, but thinking about um, the social responsibility that uh, institutes want to have and, and talk about uh, the impact that they're having, but also attraction for, for staff. Um, these are different uh, groups of customers across France. And, and even just posting on their websites uh, about the technology. And then uh, recent um, publications by different groups, um, and this was in Scotland, two different groups, which posted about uh, and created uh, different publications. Um, and when thinking about um, the future and thinking about sustainability and making sure this technology has been recognized and being built in as well. Um, and it goes on. Um, and what we're seeing is really, I think this was the first instance of this, and this is in South Tees in, in England, where 
uh, making this, uh, uh, I would say, system-wide, um, a system-wide adoption. So, South Tees has 18 operating rooms. They have a rover in 18 um, in in each operating room. Um, purely, probably driven from a health and safety point of view, but the justification of the uh, environmental impact and cost savings from an environmental pact made it possible. And as an engineer, um, I'm pretty emotionless when it comes to uh, machines, objects, but it's crazy to see how uh, staff actually name Neptunes. They put names on them. If they buy four, there's different foursome names they put on them, or if they get 12, um, because they're, it's, it's almost like part of the, uh, part of the staff. And um, this shows that just an, an amazing and um, emotional connection that they have with this, uh, with these equipment. So talk about, this is something that's recently been launched, but something that we've recently acquired is um, a AI technology in um, Silicon Valley in the US. And uh, a company was called Gauss Medical and Gauss are um, developed a, uh, different algorithms and different camera and hardware technology that is able to show the amount of uh, blood in a volume of liquid. So we talk about estimated blood loss, quantitative blood loss, um, but having a large volume of liquid or having an object which has liquid um, either soaked into it or, or on it, uh, the technology, the camera technology is able to uh, quantify the amount of blood in that either volume of liquid or on that object. And this would be part of, this is something we're working in to see how this can be either built into a Neptune system. Uh, so you could have either live feedback or, you know, once the surgery is complete, the, what the volume of blood is gonna be in the, in the liquid that has been removed. Plus a system which you would um, show, uh, if you look at the left-hand side here, um, produce a sponge in front of a camera and it estimates how many milliliters of blood are in that sponge. Uh, and you would put this as part of a, a, a procedure. Uh, so you would count out your sponges, um, put everything uh, fluid like into an, uh, a Neptune or a, uh, a, a device that works alongside the Neptune. And you would get one answer out of, uh, in, a, in a digital system to tell you this was the amount of milliliters of blood that was lost in this case. Um, and removes the guesswork and a lot of the laborsome work as well that goes into um, estimating or quantifying the amount of blood that's lost. And this is exciting, not just for one procedure type, but many different procedure types as we uh, speak to different groups of customers and get feedback. So keeping in mind the time, that's it uh, about me, uh, from me, uh, just on some of the sustainability and looking at building in some of the future innovations into uh, systems like this as well. Thank you. So Dennis, thanks very much. Stryker is a big innovation plant in Cork. Is, this, has this, is much of this work happening there? Uh, some of it is. Uh, Cork has got the Innovation Centre and uh, that's where I actually started off. Um, some of the R&D work has been done there and uh, other parts uh, in the world as well. So uh, different groups of engineers working together, uh, coming up. The Cork is designed in a air special, specialist area of technology and then you've got the different systems that come together and uh, coming up with the solutions. Okay, cool. Paul, in the interest of time, I think we have to, we have to move on. Yeah, um, I'm happy to introduce the, the last speaker, uh, Roman, um, and uh, that is uh, Mr. Michael Friedrich, who is CEO of Distal Motion, and Michael has kindly agreed to speak about the surgeon's robot, on-demand robotics with um, Dexter. Thank you so much. It's... Uh... Pleasure to uh, meet you all. Uh, great to join that conference. Indeed, my name is Michael Friedrich. I'm the CEO of Distal Motion, and we are the developer of Dexter, the on demand uh, robot for the laparoscopic surgeon. Rick uh, mentioned before that robotics is not about comparing uh, minimally invasive surgery. To, or robotics to, to open surgery, but it's rather about improving minimally invasive care. 
and and this is what we do and i'd like to take the next few minutes i know we are running a little bit late so i'll try to keep it short uh to introduce on-demand robotics to you a novel concept of, of robot robotic surgery ultimately indeed as um as mentioned uh by rick already um it's about empowering surgeons to perform high quality minimally invasive care and, and that is what robotics is all about so um with traditionally uh before the arrival of dexter surgeons were faced with an either or decision when performing minimally invasive care on the one hand surgeons were able to use the, the laparoscopy path with the uh, standard affordable uh, laparoscopic instruments that are particularly good when it comes to doing uh, basic tasks. They are outstanding when it comes to doing specialized tasks such as stapling or using a LegaSure device or, 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 or doing clip applying. That's, that's really where they excel. And they are unique when it comes to affordability and kind of still the benchmark for, for cost of, uh, of minimally invasive care. However, Lapros laparoscopy is very difficult to learn, as, as you all know, uh, when it comes to performing suturing and dissection tasks, as well as when working in confined spaces. And laparoscopy can also be very tedious and exhausting when having to do that for hours every day, uh, resulting in shoulder and back pain for, for the surgeon, and really also limiting the surgeon's ability to focus when performing those critical complex surgical tasks. And so that's the traditional laparoscopy pathway. The alternative so far has been to do it all robotic with what we call uh, fully robotic solutions, where you are uh, using the robot to perform the case from start to finish. With robots, you have uh, greatly increased dexterity. Uh, with the articulated instruments, you have increased precision. You can really work well in complex tasks, such as, again, suturing, dissection, and working in confined spaces. Plus, you have an ergonomic working position, which allows you to focus on those really critical tasks. However, with traditional robotic solutions, you are outside of the sterile field and you are indeed not able to interact with the patient and, and, and really forced to do essentially the entire procedure uh, robotically. And uh, uh, an implication of that complex feature-rich traditional robotic thinking is that robotics has also become, is also substantially more expensive than uh, laparoscopy, which is a huge adoption hurdle, as we all know. So what we're doing with Dexter with on-demand robotics it, is we are taking the advantages of laparoscopy and combining them with the advantages of robotics. It's, it's about getting robotics back onto what really matters, getting the surgeon back into the center of activity and, and really not pretending that robotic is the magic solution for everything, but that robotic is a tool among many that allows surgeons to treat patients. Robotics really using, being used for, for suturing dissection in confined uh, workspaces. And, and that is really how we uh, enable surgeons to perform minimally invasive care uh, the surgeon's way using laparoscopy for the simple tasks, uh, for the large movements, for the specialized instruments, and seamlessly then switch over to robotics for suturing and dissection. And what we are, in order to do that, the robot needs to be designed in a very particular way. Dexterous instruments, instrument articulation, ergonomics, that is a given in robotics. Everyone has that. But what we do with Dexter is that we allow the surgeons to remain scrubbed in at all times. And we allow the surgeon to switch between robotics and laparoscopy within seconds. And so one of the implications there is, um, is that the surgeon, as you might see on the right picture, remains scrubbed in when working at the Dexter Surgeon Console, it remains sterile uh, to really allow for that seamless switch. And so what I'd like to do um, 
to, is to give you a quick highlight of what that means when you are in the OR. Uh, you have uh, the surgeon console, which again is cropped in, standing next to the patient uh, on the top right side. And on the left, lower left side, you have two patient cards, each carrying one instrument, one for the left hand and one for the right hand of the surgeon. And you have a third smaller robotic arm, which is clipped to the rail, which controls the endoscope and which allows the surgeon to have that much appreciated cable, stable image and the ability to steer the endoscope himself or herself. What is truly unique about Dexter is that we really make sure that the, the robot can coexist with the surgeon and the assistant at the table. So Dexter is really designed in a way that it occupies real estate around the patient that is not otherwise used by the assistant or the surgeon. You don't need to push a cart away to access your patient. You don't need to, uh, as, a as a surgical assistant, be worried about robotic arms uh, hitting your head if you don't make evasion movements when the surgeon is operating. It's really designed for a coexistence of the robot with the laparoscopic surgeon and the laparoscopic surgical assistant at the bedside. And so uh, to illustrate that uh, in, in a video, how quickly that switch um, goes, and I am really ashamed uh, to admit that this video is not working. Um, we have, uh, what you're essentially doing is as a, as a surgeon, when you are working laparosco laparoscopically here at the, at the patient, the instrument arms are folded away the robot stays, however, docked and aligned with the trocars. And as a surgeon, you really have your traditional laparoscopic pore placement, your traditional laparoscopic access to the patient. And what you then do to switch over into robotics is as a surgeon, you simply walk two steps over to the console, uh, grab the two handles, all at the, while at the same time, the surgical assistant inserts the robotic instruments into this in, into the two uh, arms. And, and that switch that takes, we've, we've really seen that in, in clinical use, it takes less than 20 seconds. Usually it's 13, 14 seconds for the surgeon to switch from laparoscopy to robotics and vice versa when the surgeon comes back from the console, sitting at the console back to the table. It's about standing up, coming to the table, pulling out the instrument, folding the arms away. And again, that really takes uh, less than 20 seconds. And that allows for the surgeon to operate in that on-demand approach using the, the robot for when it really matters, which again is suturing and dissection. So it was all about finding the essence of robotic surgery, being humble and not overloading robotics with buzzwords and, and, and futuristic things, but going back and, and asking the question of what it is that the surgeon actually needs to improve minimally invasive care. And, and that has been a journey that has started uh, 10 years ago now, uh, when we, the team was a three-person team coming out of the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, doing a lot of research for the first five years. Um, and it's only since 2017 that this concept of Dexter really has emerged and that the, the robot has uh, started to be developed. So really when we started to understand how to simplify those complex surgical tasks. And uh, as part of that co-development with surgeons, we have had more than 60 surgical teams uh, in cadaver labs, in dry labs, in early clinical use, uh, testing various new ways of introducing robotic surgery, it, understanding and defining robotic surgery. Uh, what you see here is a cadaver lab in Bern with a predecessor version where uh, the surgeon is already partially sterile. Um, really a journey that has now taken us to a stage where Dexter is in clinical use, it is in commercial use in, in, in Western Europe, where patients are treated every day and where that on-demand robotic mindset, that new category of robotic surgery that is consciously and purposely designed for the laparoscopic surgeon and with the laparoscopic surgeon is entering real-life clinical use. Again, 
We want the laparoscopic surgeons to remain laparoscopic surgeons, but to get access to robotic dexterity, precision, ergonomics, and uh, camera control when it makes clinical sense and when the surgeon really wants that. And, and, and that is really what, what Dexter is about. We simplify it, we remove complexity. And, and as a result of that, a logical implication also is that we make it much more affordable because there is no unnecessary feature in Dexter. And, and, and that really is what Dexter is all about. And, and uh, yeah, uh, what I wanted to share with you. And I'm again, appreciate the opportunity here to, to speak and I look forward to potential discussions now in the last part of this uh, session. You are on mute, Ronan. <laughs> yeah, sorry. It's a great talk, but it's a great story, isn't it? The distal motion story. Uh, as CEO, you've gone, you've gotten far fast. That seems to be, that seems to be the way of things these days. But I'd imagine it's stressful. It is when 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 you're inside uh, it uh, and and you're you're fighting with uh, all the hundred things you need to worry about. To Rick's point, uh, sometimes it it feels quite lengthy, but in, in, in retrospect, five years, now we are 100 people, we're in the field, um, it, time flies uh, quite quickly, yeah. And how big is data collection a part of the, do you think, the, the, uh, of the Dexter ambition? It, it, it is very important, and um, it is first and foremost focused on making sure that all the users have the sufficient proficiency to use Dexter. So we really target data in a first phase around surgeon skills, surgeon experience, also tracking then uh, surgeon behaviors over time uh, on how well they perform. You always all see changes in, in the staff, in the teams that also set it up uh, that, are, uh, that also need to be monitored. So we, the first phase of data is about making sure that the device is used safely and is useful to the, to, to the surgeon. And in a second step, yes, you will then be able to add all the extra layers on top of it uh, for potential decision support, potential, potential guidance, and, and obviously then also back that with, with clinical publications. Sure. Paul, I thought we'd just do a quick fire round for everyone. Could, could you all turn your cameras back on and we'll kind of cover the, the audience questions. But this, the point of this is just to give maybe a one word answer or two word answer, please. Um, we start maybe just by the screen. Michael, you're up first. So data collection, aggregation, mandatory or opt out on a, from an individual surgeon basis? Mandatory. Rick? Mandatory. George? Um, that, that depends, Ron. <laughs> I think it depends on the use case. So I'll, I'll go with, I'll sit on the fence on that one until I, I I know a bit more about the question. Dennis? I'd say it depends. Mark? Mandatory. Uh, so Sergio, Conan, that's what happens when you work for a big company. They don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> Surgical video is just data or a special case. Michael? It, it's more than the image itself. Okay, but is it a special case or is it just, is it, should it just be sucked up into the cloud with, with every other bit of data collection or mm. is there something special? No, it? it's not necessary to have everything all the, okay. in Rick, my opinion. Rick? Agree with Michael. So not, not needed. Sir, not needed. Not needed. George? Hey, look, is the, is the representation of exactly what uh, was performed uh, and so I, I think it's 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 critical actually and I think it will become the standard standard but is it is, is there a special case about it or is it just data um I, I mean data is a means to an end right so um uh the end is being able to understand surgery uh, much more efficiently effectively so um no it's not just data it, it's there's a bigger purpose to it Dennis? I think it's just data. Mark? Mark, are you, are you, maybe you're frozen there. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, in its current form, it's just data, but it needs to be massively curated to be more valuable, which it will be. 
in, in the fullness of time. Um, and but just to have thousands of videos in the cloud, valueless. Okay. When will AI uh, do a routine operation? Question from our president, Michael. Uh, relatively far in the future. It's still the surgeon that matters. How relatively far? Five, five, five years? I, I, I cannot judge. Yeah, more than five. Rick? Around five to eight years in that window. George? It's longer than that, uh, but, it, but it'd be within our lifetime. Dennis? Never. Mark? I tend to be as Dennis. So to get to get there, though, you, you've all mentioned you need millions of data points, huge numbers of data. So the role of the individual surgeon now is just as a data point in the cloud. Michael? No, the surgeon is the, the, the ultimate decision maker. It's the center of everything. For how, maybe for, for how long is the next question? Rick? Yeah, no, I think you're always going to have the surgeon in there no matter what. You're not, you're not, you're not going to replace the surgeon uh, completely, but you're going to bring in AI to completely guide the procedure. George? Yeah, I'd look at things like radiology and, and consider the, the opportunity there. Uh, I think surgery, there's a, there's a, a very different complexity. Uh, that's not, not, <laughs> not to denigrate radiologists whatsoever, um, but I think the... the uh, Actually, performing the operation is clearly a, a key differentiation uh, from diagnostics, and so therefore, I, I think the surgeon remains the centre. Dennis, yeah, surgeon was Mark. Yeah, the surgeon remains the centre, but we'll have huge addition from um, AI decision making processes, etc., standardisation, all those sort of steps, which will massively improve the surgical outcome. Okay, so. The direction of the medical industry, maybe in 10 years' time, do you think it's just going to be a couple of huge conglomerates, a couple of really big, big players who own everything, are still remaining as an ecosystem of kind of startup and some, you know, that, that kind of uh, ver ver variety of vendors and providers that we have now? Major innovation still needs to come from, uh, from independent entities, new ventures. Rick? Yeah, you're absolutely, you're always going to see the startups, but I think you are going to have maybe somewhere again, three to five kind of major players around there that control 99% of the dollars going in, but their innovation is going to come from, uh, from the small, smaller companies for sure. George? Yeah, I, the operating room needs an operating system. And I think that there likely will be a few vendors that are able to provide that, but I think innovation from startups is absolutely critical. And I also have my doubts on some of the big tech, Googles and others being able to um, adopt this space. So I think it will come with that from, from outside. Dennis? Yeah, there'll, there'll always be the role of the um, small startup and they can move faster, quicker. It's, a, it's an ecosystem, both needs each other. Mark? Yeah, innovators will always be the key, but what I'd like to see is more scrutiny on um, what one could almost call false data sometimes coming out of very large companies. Um, so more, is, is the claims, are the claims genuine? Do they really give value? Uh, most useful way to collaborate with industry. Do you think that's individual surgeon, hospital, or university? Michael. Depends on the topic at hand. We, we need all these actors and access to them. Rick? I've always had a favor towards just individual surgeons. That's always been the route that worked the best for us. And so I'm definitely a bias just for working with the individuals. George? Yeah, my email address was shared. So I'd say get, get in touch. That's the best way. Um, individual surgeons, I'd, I'd agree um, uh, with that comment, yeah. Dennis? It depends on the technology, it depends on the benefits, um, but I also think the more eyes and the more views you've got on it, the better it is going to be for the whole system. Mark? Yeah, individual surgeons. Okay. Ireland, any particular special opportunity in developing sur sur surgery or just, just a small little island off the, off the coast of Europe? Michael? If, if Ireland is a special... Can you kindly read? 
Yeah, sure. sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's sure it's an it's an important uh, market and, and and it's also an important uh, uh, bridge I guess uh, pillar to uh, to to reach the globe. Rick, yeah, I think it's critical. I think just the location being so central, you got to remember a lot of these big medical device companies have all their money deposited in Ireland. They have a lot of their IP held in Ireland as well. And so I think it's, you've given them incredible tax breaks and incentives to be there. Now you need to get them to do something for you. George? Yeah, my wife's Irish and my kids are dual Irish. So uh, what can I say? Ireland is super important. Um, but I, I do think there's a, there's a real opportunity with the Irish healthcare system, I, I think, and, and, and specifically with the direction of travel with digitization. I draw some parallels with the Australian market. Um, there and, and I do think there's tremendous opportunity um, with a, a forward-looking healthcare system that really wants to embrace um, digitization. So I think it's it's super important. I wouldn't say anything else, but I, I really do believe that. Dennis, yeah, I think the the moves made by Irish governments in the 80s and 90s set it up for success. But I would say so. It is really important. I would say don't rest on our laurels. I think uh, other company, other countries could um, could disrupt very quickly. Mark. I think you've got an absolutely unique position. It's a relatively small health system. You all know each other quite well. So the opportunities for large scale collaboration on data collection, on standardization, I would say are incredible in Ireland. Paul, I think this has been a great session. Would you like to, have you no, got I, any question? I, or? No, I, my, my only question is um, surgeons of the future, will they, will they actually go to conventional medical school anymore or do we need to think about an alternative uh, training strategy for them? Do they need to go to five or six years of medical school? Do, do we see them coming out of that anymore? Um, perhaps that's a rhetorical question and for another day. Um, no, but I think it's a great question. So that's, that's the surgeon as technologist. Yeah. Michael? Uh, product specific training is important, but you also need to learn to do the procedure itself, and 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 so it requires both uh, both parts, I guess. Rick, same as Michael. George, uh, aging population and and the need for more surgery, I, I think, is going to demand different training pathways. Whether that's for full qualified surgeons or, or different specialties within the operating room. Um, but I think it's, it's going to be a necessity in terms of affordability of healthcare. Dennis? Uh, fundamentals are still going to have to be taught. I want my airline pilot to still be able to fly by wires. <laughs> Mark? Yeah, I, I think um, I always tell the youngsters who ask me how they do what I do. I say become a really good doctor first. And when you master that, then move on to the other things. So yeah, lots of room for normal training. Okay, well, it sounds like our medical schools are safe, Roland. So uh, <laughs> that's good. Um, Roland, I, I just like to say that this has been a truly amazing session, not just a good session, but an amazing session, uh, amazing talks by truly amazing people. And uh, I have to thank my, uh, I have to thank Roland as well because he picked these people to talk today. And it's been a real eye opener for me in the latter part of my career. And I'm very grateful to be part of this session. I think I think it's been great, guys. Thank you all very much. I think we're on time too, are we? We actually are, Roland. Yeah. Amazing. Thank, Thank you so much. Great. Cheers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank you, everyone. Bye.